power of the Lord. A power of the Lord. As I was praying even this morning, just sitting in the hallway, and the Lord began to speak to me and to lighten my spirit. And he said, he said, everything's all right. I have already prepared a blessing to flow on this church. My church is what he said. <laughs> I prepared a blessing to flow on this church. My church. That's what he said. My church. Well, you know, we are part of, uh, part of the body of Christ. But he said, I, I said that to him. I said, thank you, Lord. We're part of the body of Christ. He said, there are some churches that are churches, but they aren't mine. They're doing it for them. And he said, I prepared a blessing to flow on my church. You're the leader of my church here. I was blessed. I wrote that down. I said, Father God, that ministered to me. He said, I'm pleased with you and pleased with the church. Listen, folks coming in and scurrying around, getting it all set up this morning. I saw faith in operation. People were praying. Folks were putting things up. I'm expecting something good today. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Let's pray and get started. Father, in the name of Jesus, the power of God is loosed in this place and we receive the very blessing of the Lord. Thank you, Father, for honoring us with your presence this day. And I give you praise, Lord God, for what's going to happen. Thank you, Lord. Use me, my mind, my will, my emotion, every part that it's all of you and none of me. And I just give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Open your Bibles this morning to Proverbs 20 and verse 12. Amen. Hallelujah. Proverbs 20. Now most people don't read Proverbs 20 and verse 12 because it's so short. See, we're word people, but we're... Now be honest, we're favorite word people. <laughs> we all have a favorite word, but here's what he said to me. He said, ears that hear... I had to stop and try to figure out what's he talking about. Ears that hear and eyes that see and the Lord has made them both. I stopped for a moment. I said, Lord, I'm, he said, read it again. I said, ears that hear and eyes that see and the Lord has made them both. He said, concentrate on this. Ears to hear and eyes to see. What do you get out of that? I said, well, these are sensory perceptors that affect the way I see things. He said, exactly. Exactly. He said, with your ears you hear, with your eyes you see, with your hands you touch, with your feelings you feel, and all these things affect your perception. There's power in perception. Today I'm going to talk to you about the power of perception. The power of perception. And what's that mean, perception? Well, that means to be aware. To be aware. What, what's your surrounding like? What are you sitting around? What are you near? What do you listen to? What do you read? What, what, in, what are you involved in? The power of perception is how you think. Eyes to see, ears to hear, and it all goes to your mind to understand. And with that, the senses gather information that goes into your mind. When it leaves your mind, it tells your body what to do. But it's all figured out in your mind. And until your mind is completely renewed, you have the potential for all that information to be distorted. Your distortion will distort your perception. If you allow the senses to be feeding the information incorrectly, your perception will cause distortion. Are you with me? There's power in perception. Look with me in Mark chapter 8. We're going to look at verse 22. Some of you read this verse before. You've read these things before. But maybe you've done like I've done in much of my past. I read a verse. This one I hadn't spent a lot of time on. But it says in Mark 8 and verse 22, he came to Bethsaida. He came to Bethsaida. And while he was at Bethsaida, they, 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 I had to look this up. That's not the disciples. That was the people of the city. 
They, they, they brought a blind man to Jesus and begged him to touch him. That wasn't the disciples. The disciples would have said, here, Master, here's the one that needs help. They weren't begging him. The people of the city brought him. It says in most scholars right now, it's city folk that brought him in. They were just playing around. Go ahead, heal him. Beg him. Go ahead. Go ahead. Lay hands on it. So they brought this man to him and said, touch him. They took a blind man. Now Jesus took the blind man by the hand and walked him out of the town. Now, I've read that before, but I didn't find the significance in my mind. And when I was praying, the Lord actually placed me in the city. And there were all these town folks chiding Jesus, go ahead, heal him, go ahead. <laughs> Put your hand on him. Put your hand on him. And they begged him. And Jesus took the blind, didn't say anything to the people. Took the blind man by the hand. I'm sure he put his little arm in his arm and walked him out of the town. Where were the disciples? Who knows? <laughs> he walked him out of the town and then he spit on his eyes. Oh, I've read this verse so fast. He spit on his eyes. And I go on because spit is defiling. It's insulting. Anybody ever been spit on? Come on. Couple been spit on? You can been spit on in, when you were seven years old in the back of a bus and you're a big 67 now, you don't forget it. I spit on when I was a kid. Because the spittle, you remember what happened, you remember what you said, you remember what they did, because it's so insulting, it's so degrading, it's so obnoxious that someone would take their spittle and put it on your body. You can still feel the goo rolling down your face because it is offensive. This is what happened right here. And he was spit on. He was spit on. It's not a reaction that you would smile about. Oh, I like that. That was great. That's not going to happen. That's not what happens. And so it's so insulting and so degrading. It is something that Jesus did. And you've got to understand the methodology of this healing was base and vile. But he spit on him. He spit on him. He spit on, only three times in the scriptures just did Jesus use his spit for healing. One time, one time, he put a little spit on his finger. <laughs> and he touched the man's eyes, be healed. And the man went healed. Amen. Another time, I was, uh, no, that, I'm sorry, he spit on his, and he put on the tongue. Put on his tongue, and the man was healed. Another time, blind man came to him and he said, hmm, what do, you, what do you want me to do, Lord? And the father told him, spit in the mud. So he spit and made a little pile of mud and he twirled it around with his finger, much like you do with dough when you're making a little, you know, make a little, a little, and you put it together, make a little dough because you're going to make biscuits or something. So he put that on his eye and he was healed. And this one, he, <laughs> is vile. This one's offensive. This one, the other ones were okay. You could deal with that. But when someone spits in your eye, this is what happened here. And the healing came when he walked him out of town. He walked him out of town. Then he spit in his eye, laid his hands on him, and put his hands on him and asked him, you see anything? Now, when you get to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 11, very easily, it says, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Now, what's this have to do with where I'm going? Let me explain. You can tell when you are grown up, you put away childish things. Because what do children think about? Me, 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 my, 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 I, 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 mine, that's mine. What's, where's mine? 
They're always thinking about me. And you can know when you've grown up, when you put away the childish things, and many times people are still dealing with childish things and trying to pray adult prayers. So they're still interested in me, my, 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 my. And God said, pray for others as you pray for yourself. Where we miss it is we haven't grown up. And so in this case, we got to see this. This case, you got to become a man. You got to make a change. God, and here's what's important. God doesn't heal everybody in the same method. Oh, I thank God for that because we would have we made some kind of a, uh, what do you call it, a doctrine? We'd have made a doctrine out of it. Yeah, if a, guy is, if a guy's got healing he needs in his eyes, spit on him. We'd have made a doctrine out if he'd done it twice. <laughs> but we have a tendency to not understand because the majority of a real afflicted people sometimes can cause all kinds of condemnation to come on others for how they receive their healing. I've heard it for 30 years. Somebody that need to go to the doctor, they're so conflicted with all kinds of things themselves, they'll start to say, well, where's your faith? And they'll point at you and try to give you some kind of feeling like you're not, you're not a, a person. Well, no, you can't pray adult prayers when you're dealing childlike. But if you're listening to the Lord, he'll tell you exactly what to do to get your healing. Amen. Because he doesn't heal everybody the same way. Glory to God. Now, something very important here in this bold story from Mark chapter 8. It indicates that some, he, some he, listen to me, some healings are progressive. It's good to get that immediate healing. I thank God for that. Done it many times. But many healings are progressive. That does not mean it's still not God. That does mean it is God. Healing is from God no matter how it comes. But here's something you need to know. One touch is not always enough to fix it. I'm going to say it again. One touch is not always enough to fix it. We'll get to this point in a minute. One trip to the altar is not always enough. One time in prayer is not always enough. One laying on of hands is not always enough. Somebody said, well, you had hands laid on you. Well, it's all right. Do it again. If you need more, get more. Hallelujah. Just be honest with yourself. Praise God. Now, some people function or try to function under the one-touch experience. And they think they're all that because they stood in a healing line once and Kenneth Hagin himself touched them. So they will not go to a doctor or ever see anybody else in help. You know that everyone that Jesus healed died. I'm just saying. Because <laughs> there's a point that you're going, you know, the devil's going to try to get. And that's his job. He steals, kills, and destroys. And so you got to take care of yourself. You got to take care of what God said to do. You could function under this one touch experience because you pretend you're better than you are. Now, I'm all for faith, but you got to listen to the Lord. And if he says, I want you to add this to your faith, you just do that because that's God's plan. That's going to get you out. Are you with me? Some of you are saying, yeah, I'm with you. I hear you. Well, praise God. Listen. Sometimes you can get totally distracted and you miss out on the full information what the Lord's trying to say even in this verse. I was so distracted with the healing of this man, I never recognized the other stuff that's going on. This morning, I'm going to try to describe to you what you might have missed too. Are you ready for that? Praise God. Jesus came to Bethsaida. Anybody know anything about Bethsaida? Bethsaida is a very interesting port of fishermen. It's a fishing port where the fishing men hung out. The rough man and rough men in a rough port with rough language and rough attitude and rough hunger and rough 
They get up early. They sweat hard. They talk bad. Just anybody ever been around a bunch of sweaty men? And, and I mean, we're talking Jim Locker talk. I mean, we're sweaty old stinking men. And, and they're coming off a stinking fishing boat. And sometimes men make jokes about stuff that women would go, really? I mean, they, they, they just make, they think it's funny. And nobody else thinks it's funny because they're just ugly old fishermen and trying to just make it cute and make it all laugh and they're rough and they're sweating and they're carrying on and this kind of caliber of people we're talking about the lowest kind because the devil always tries to prompt those that are thinking about what's going on in their life and their muscles hurt and they have to get up early and they're just thinking about what's the problem and they don't think about because they don't perceive what's right this is what's going on in that city now in Bethsaida, you got to see what they said. The men talk rough. They say things rough. They act rough. They're degrading and they're rude. This is not a place for those that are faint of heart. Are you with me? Some of you got to realize, I did not really think about that till the Lord had me look it up. And the more I got to looking at it, I realized this is a nasty old rough place. This is a really rough place. Then these folks are tired. And they're hungry. Anybody ever been tired and hungry? Do you act all right all the time when you're tired and hungry? These guys are tired and hungry every time they come off the boat. They're tired and they're hungry. This place is rough. This is Bethsaida and it's rough. And when they came to Bethsaida, when they came to Bethsaida, when they came to, they brought, they, this is not the disciples, they brought this man to Jesus to see if he could do anything. They were having chiding him with a little fun. Are you with me? Now Jesus loved to go there. He had been there before. He had performed several miracles, but not of this particular type. Now, catch this out. But God's tender mercy. He loved this man so much. He's going to heal him. He's going to heal him. Change this whole man's life. And God loves you so much. He's going to heal you from the inside out. Everything. Your attitude, your will, Way you're, he loves you so much it could change your whole life. You ready for that? Oh glory. Now what if he had ignored the they? And they came to him and grabbed him and said, we're going to take you to Jesus. Let, let, let me go. I'll just stay here. I don't need your help. He knew these are a bunch of rough people. They got rough language and rough talk. They're rough. And they grabbed a hold of him to take him over to Jesus to make him a spectacle. And he's on his way over there. They're pushing him. And, pro and what if he'd have said, that's enough. I live by myself. I, this, I, I seen before. And then I went blind. Because it doesn't say he was blind from his birth. But he said, I went blind. And I'm just, I've learned how to make it on my own. Leave me alone. I've got to make it on my own. Some people are really proud to try to make it on their own. No matter what difficulty they're dealing with. And so he said, I'm going to make it. What if he'd have done that? But they brought him to Jesus. And when he came to Bethsaida, the first thing that Jesus did, before he healed him, he said, come with me. And he walked him out of the city. <laughs> now, there's a significance here. They walked, he walked them out of the city. Jesus had come to Bethsaida to do his work. He'd done this before. He walked into the city to do his work. I imagine if the disciples were there, they said, Jesus, you just got here. I can't believe you're on your way out. I mean, we just come here for work. We've done some ministry here before. Now you're ready to tote out and get out of town? What's going on? You got to see something, what they were thinking. We're here with you. We're part of the ministry team. What are you doing grabbing this guy and you're out of the town? Now, we're here to help. Just tell us what we need to do and we'll do it. They were all singing out the problem. But the first thing Jesus does is lead the blind man out of town. I would imagine that there was some distraction going on with the environment from the healing. Would you? Jesus turns right around and takes him out of that town and heals him. Well, I, I, I had to ask God, well, God, you know, I read this thing dozens of times and I said and I hadn't spent as much time as I had in the last week going over these verses but I looked at this and I said Lord aren't you the God of Bethsaida too I mean you're God of the whole earth why why couldn't you heal him in the town why couldn't you take care of this thing right there and he said it to me like this 
He said, I had to take the man out of Bethsaida. It was very important. It was very important because the blind man had to receive in a new environment. It's the only way he would receive. Sometimes, and this is how he said it, he says, until the man perceives his environment correctly, he's not going to change. Sometimes we don't perceive our environment correctly. We can get offended, we can get hurt, but he didn't want him to have anything in an obstacle when the healing comes, let's get you out of town. So he took him out of town. Boy, there's power in perception. Could it be possible that the environment was feeding his condition? That's a thought. Is there something going on in your life that's being fed by the environment that you keep yourself in? If there's something difficult that you need to stop, here's the hard part, stopping. <laughs> Cut it out. Some things you don't need to look at, some things you don't need to listen to, some things you don't need to be around, some people you don't need to be around. But you keep going back there, they keep doing the wrong thing, you keep going back there, you keep doing the wrong thing. God says, come out, be peculiar, be different, Sit, be, stand away from them, don't be like the world, come out from among them, be a, 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 a peculiar people, a holy nation. And some people decided they're going to act like the world and then they wonder why they can't have a change in their own personal world. Well, maybe the environment is keeping them from the full healing. Some people say, well, I don't have enough money. Maybe the environment is keeping you from a full healing. Well, I can't get any friends. Maybe your environment is keeping you from a full healing. Well, well I'm not totally healed. Maybe your environment is keeping you from a full healing. Wow. When I heard the Lord say it to me like that, he said, I want to tell you something. You and Jesus are using this blind man as an example. He said, I am using the blind man as an example of the problems they were dealing with in Bethsaida. I said, okay. He said, you are sending a message to the people. What about your environment? That was a word from the Lord. What, what about your environment? What are you staying around that you don't need to be around? He's trying to make a point to us. Could it be possible that Bethsaida is contributing to this man's despair? Well, he led him out of the city. He led him out of the city. And I had to ask the Lord. I said, Lord, there's a lot of bad things going on. But is there something particular about what they're doing in that city you don't like? I mean, you took them out of the city. So there must be, there's something particular about that city you don't like. I mean, I read in the Word, you went to that particular city number of times and healed people. So I know you can heal there, but why did you not heal this one man there? Well, he took me to Matthew eleven twenty one. In Matthew eleven twenty one, it says, Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. Huh. I looked at that and I said, well, whoa. I'm going to I'm have to check that out. Woe to you. Because for the mighty works that have been done in your city, had they been done in Tyre or Sidon, the people would have repented. I've done many marvelous acts in your city, and the people would have repented already if they'd have seen it in Tyre and Sidon, because they would have repented with sackcloth and ashes. But this city, this city, this Bethesda, is awful in the reception of spiritual things. They refuse to receive spiritual things from heaven. They are committed to being dysfunctional in their spiritual walk with God. They still chiding. They're still committing. For, they think that things that are happening are not truly the power of God. Even seeing it with their own eyes. Hearing it with their own ears. Feeling it with their own feelings. Number of people in their city had it happen and they still denied the power thereof. Wow. 
That's what he said about Chorazin. That's what he said about the Seda. He said, if any other city would have had this happen, they'd have been repentant by now. But you are so hard-hearted. You won't even let me get in your heart. Wow. That's pretty powerful right there. Well, then I began to read that and I said, Lord, you know, I already know. Some of the disciples came from Bethsaida. You say, really? Oh, yeah. Take a look here. Take a look at John chapter, chapter 1, verse 43. John chapter 1, verse 43 and 44. It says, the following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee, where he found Philip. And he said to him, follow me. Now, Philip, in verse 44, Philip was from Bethsaida. And so were Andrew and Peter. Wow. Three disciples came from one city. They still wouldn't honor the power of God. Now, I had to ask the Lord. I said, these people won't honor the power of God. And he said, I'm going to show you something. Some places, you now, he said one thing, listen to me. These men came out of the city. Some places you can't stay, you got to get out. Because you'll never reach your potential if you stay where you're staying. Powerful. Powerful. Proverbs 16, it says in verse 17, it says, The path of the godly leads away from evil. Wow, the path of the godly gets away from evil. You don't sit in the evil and say, well, I'm going to just be different among them. If God didn't send you to be different among them, you better just get out of the way. Amen. Because some people are trying to reach an area where they say they just got delivered from, and they go back to the same area. God didn't send them to that area, but they go back to the area where they've been delivered from, and before you know it, they're back doing the same thing they did before. Because the devil is relentless in pulling them down and messing up their mind by the distractions of those that are in that place. Because their perception is powerful. Amen. You've got to get out of that place. Get away from evil. You've got to go away from evil because those that follow that path are going to be safe. Unless the Lord send you to that path where it's evil. Unless he send you to that path where, where there's trouble. Don't even think about being there until you get so strong you can do it. Amen. You got to get out of that. Amen. So this is what the Lord said. He said he took the man outside the village so the healing would come. He took the man outside the village so the healing can come. Because once he got him outside his environment, it was easy to heal him. There are some of you need to get out of the environment you're in. Some of you need to get away from some of the friends you have. And the reason is because they're still worldly. And you say, well, I'm there to minister to them. No, no, no. Fooling yourself. Unless the Lord sends you to minister to them, unless he's called you, unless you can stand up against what they're doing, you're going to end up being like them. You say, well, I, I, don't do, I don't do what they do. I don't act like they act. I don't say what they say. But I will be counted among them because I'm still in the place where they are. And the Bible says, don't even put on the appearance of evil. Doesn't it? You say, don't, don't, don't go around the appearance. Because other people judge you based on where they see you. They, they judge you based on where they see you. Listen, I was in Bible school. I happened to be at a quick stop. And I saw somebody from Bible school going through some of them magazines. Them not so, them ones that aren't made for children. Are you with me? Them them adult magazines. And then, and, and then they're like flipping through them. And I walk in and they go, Whoa, what are you doing here? <laughs> they didn't stay long in Bible school. Because you're supposed to come out from among them. If you don't do that, the devil's quick to put you back. You're going to be skewed in your perception. Amen. Now here's what. Jesus took him outside the city and then he spat on him. That's where he spat on him. He was saying out of his own actions, my spit is better than the treasures of Bethsaida. Amen. That's pretty powerful. And he was saying, 
foolishness in the hands of God is better than the wisdom of men. Amen. Some people come to church on Sunday and they think they can make it all week. Well, praise God, but there's the devil out there. And he's trying to rob you. So they get a touch from God on Sunday. They're pretty good on Monday. Pretty good on Tuesday. Worn out on Wednesday. Dragging through on Thursday. Hoping they make it through Friday. Dear God, it's Saturday. And they come to church on Sunday and get a little dab. And they rub the little dab on. They can try it again. Here we go. <laughs> and they say, I don't know why it's not getting any better, Pastor. I'm trying. You know what trying means, don't you? It's like pastors. When folks call them and they say, Pastor, I'm going to try to be at church. That don't mean nothing. <laughs> It doesn't mean anything because they can't make it. If you're trying, it's not enough. You either do or don't do. You can't just try. Are you with me? So it's important to make a change. Get out of his environment and Jesus spat on him. Now here's something that bothered me. Why doesn't this man get angry? If you got spit going on you, and I was spit on once, I got angry. I couldn't believe they'd even do that. Can't, you, that you get out of your own mouth. You put that spittle that runs in your filthy mouth on me. I, mean, I, I was angry. But here's what the Lord was saying. He says, when you are desperate for a change, when you are desperate for something to get different, when you are desperate to get out, you'll put up with anything for a change. But when you're not desperate, it's insulting. One time, I needed help financially. Well, no, I take that. I need help a lot of times financially. But one time, <laughs> I needed so much help, I went to one of those places to get help. One of them government-run places. Now, most government-run places are pretty good. I would imagine. I haven't been to them. But I walked into one of them government-run places. I really needed money. I had my kids, my wife, and we weren't, we weren't having any food, and, and the things were bad. It was getting really, it was really low. I was, I was trusting the Lord, but it just wasn't coming in. I said, well, I've been paying into this all these years, so I'm going to go get a little help at this time. And I went in, I said, I need a little help. And the woman said, well, I can't believe you'd come at this time. You're a grown man. Get a job. She was insulting. She was degrading. She belittled me. I was so insulted by what she said, but sometimes when you're hurting so bad, you can't take the luxury of being insulted. You have to just eat it and take the help. Amen. Because if you want something so bad, you'd overlook the insult. Insult is made for those that are luxury, they don't feel that they absolutely are desperate to get it. Luxury of insult is for those that are not desperate. But if you're desperate, you walk on the pavement half a mile on the, without any shoes on and no socks and, and steaming hot. I mean 110 degrees outside. You'll walk across there to get some help because you're desperate. Because desperate people do what they have to do to get done what they're wanting to get done. But if you're not desperate, you won't go do that. Some people won't come to the church because they're not desperate. Now listen to me. They'll come here one time and they'll say, it's a little too hot for me. Other people say, a little too cold for me. A little too loud for me. I don't like the way that people looked. I think there might be some hypocrites. <laughs> well, yeah, but... If you let a hypocrite keep you from going to God, then they're closer to God than you are. <laughs> Amen. So I tried, to, I, I tried to tell the Lord, I said, wait, you know, how come? He said, because they'll let anything offend them. And they'll easily quit, and they won't try, and they won't do it again, because they're not desperate. But when you're desperate, and I prayed to the Lord, and he said, your church... My church, what he called it this morning. He said, my church is for the desperate souls. The desperate people do whatever they need to do to get the result they're looking for. He said, that's what I'm building this church on, is the desperate souls. Ooh, I was moved. I said, Lord, 
That's good. Praise God. In Joshua 1.9 it says, Be bold, be strong, banish fear and doubt. For remember the Lord God is with you wherever you go. This place is for desperate people because I'll tell you what, you come here, you got to make up your mind. Am I going to get something from the Lord? You bet I am. Some people come with the thought, I got some stuff in my life that needs to change. I got some attitudes in myself that needs to change. I got some ways that I'm doing that need to change. I need my finances to change. I need my healing to change. I need my relationships to change. You can't come to God saying, well, whatever. You ought to come here with a thing in mind and desperate to get it. Because when you are, God said, I'll open a door for you that no man could open. I'll give you more blessings from heaven because you came to me with an open heart. Desperate for the Lord. Mark chapter 8 and verse 22 one more time. He came to Bethsaida. And he, they, they, they brought a blind man unto him and they begged him to touch him. So he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And then he spit on him and put his hands on him and asked him, Do you see anything? And he said, Yeah. And he looked up and said, I see men walking like trees. He must have known what men look like. And he must have known what trees look like. Or you couldn't associate the two. This wasn't a man blind from birth. This is a man that was blind after he'd seen. So he saw men walking like trees. And Jesus took him by the hand and led him out of the city. But the question this morning the Lord said to me, he says, ask the people, are you willing to change your perception? Are you willing to change your perception? If you're willing to change, there's hope. Because Jesus determines the depth of your inner healing by your outlook. You're not inner healed if you still have a bad outlook. Wow. That's pretty good. I told the Lord, I said, what is it you want? He said, how are the people seeing things? Some of us say, well, that's not how I see it. That's not how I see it. Because we have a skewed perception. But he said, you've got to see things differently, especially people. Especially people. Especially people. Do you distrust them? All of them? All the time? <laughs> Some people do. Have a real distrust for people, a fear of people, an apprehension of people. Acknowledgement that people are bad, always bad, doing bad things, always acting bad, saying bad things. They got a skewed perception because the devil has used their environment to skew their perception downhill all the time. That's all they think of. Or do you have a perception about people, faith, hope, and love? You know, he won't let a minister be a minister, a true minister of God, unless he always sees people through the eyes of God. And he sees you with faith, hope, and love. That's always on God's mind. Because God is love. He's always thinking in the right perception. Isn't that marvelous? Praise God. However you see them tells God where you are in your recovery. Amen. 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 Why didn't the man fix his eyes on something else? I mean, there might have been some houses close by or maybe, you know, maybe seen some rocks or something. Why didn't he put his eyes on them? Because God's not concerned about your eyes on a tree or on rocks, but on people. But see, he saw the people as trees. His perception was still skewed. It was still off. It was still not right. Wow. There wasn't many people around outside the city. They were all in city. So he had to find someone to focus on. And he found a person. And he still saw him looking at like trees. Your outlook is a reflection of what's going on inside. Oh, the power of perception. 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 
Perception. It's very important to God. Your perception is very important. It's more important than you know. Some people think, well, I can think whatever I want. God doesn't care. I can think whatever I want. God's concerned about how you think. Because he said, cast down those imaginations. Bring every thought to the obedience of Christ. Some people think bad thoughts all the time. They come to church, they go, oh, praise God, how you doing? <laughs> and they just masquerade the thought instead of getting fixed from the thought process. So they're pretending they're healed because they got one touch. They need another touch. Are you with me? Amen. He said, I see men walking as trees. Is the problem his eyes? Or is the problem his perception? Wow. You could get a legitimate touch from God and still have improper perception. You could be saved and still not recovered. In 2 Corinthians 6.14 it says, Be not unequally yoked. Anybody read that one? It says, Be not unequally yoked. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. So that, if you have a skewed perception, that is almost giving you permission that if someone says they're a Christian, they're a candidate to marry. It doesn't matter if they act like it, but they said it. So their perception is skewed. If they read that verse, do not be unequally yoked, they think they've got permission to go be with the one that it's not even God's plan, but they know what the Word says, so the devil has bombarded their environment to facade around them often enough that they finally slip into it, and then they say, how'd this happen? Because the devil started to create a trap years before. Amen. And they didn't even know it. And then they read scripture and say, well, you know, God hates divorce. You just stay together no matter what. I'll tell you, you know, the Bible says, unless for adultery, there's no escape. Well, you know, you can have adultery with the world. You're doing the things of the world over and over and over. You have adultery with the world and you have God's permission to escape that. Because you won't obey the word of the Lord. You won't act right. And it says, get away from evil. Walk away from evil. Ooh, that's good stuff. He says, get out of there. Now, God wants us to do what is right. The problem with some Christians on that verse that says, do not be unequally yoked, they're not aware that there are something called Christian crazies. They say they're Christian, but they're acting completely opposite of what the Bible says to act. And they say it. I'm, I'm Christian. That's crazy. That's crazy right there. Because <laughs> the Bible says if you don't do the Word of God, you're not even considered a, you're not considered a Christian. He said you've got to be a doer, not just a hearer. If you're here, you're just deceiving yourself. Amen. Amen. And he's saying that to us. You need to be a doer of the word, not just a hearer, because if you're just a hearer, you're just deceiving yourself, and you're trying to fool everybody around you, and you haven't admitted, I see men as trees. Woo, that's some, that's some serious stuff. And you're dealing under a first stage of recovery. Now this man legitimately got a touch from God. He had an experience with the Lord, and he's better but he's not whole. He's better, but he's not whole. He's better, but he's not whole. He's not whole. Because he's being held back by his perception. Do you think, now that's a good question, do you think that Jesus needed to ask the man, what do you see to know what he's thinking? He's God. God's talking to him all the time. He's in constant contact with the Father. He's hearing the Lord say it. He's hearing God talk to him. He didn't need to ask that man nothing. He's God omnipotent. He's the God that um, omniscient. He's everywhere. He, can, he knows the thoughts. He perceives their thoughts. Because God's speaking to him. And he knew what the man saw. He just wanted to get the man to say it. 
Because he could have said, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay. It's better than it was. Some of us are living in a better than it was situation. But it's still not whole. Still not getting the fullness of God. In Psalms 103 and verse 2, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities and heals you of all diseases. God was putting his hand on this man to heal. God did not have to hear from the man to be able to evaluate his situation. He already knew. He just wanted the man to admit it. Most of us don't admit it when we don't get through. We have a breakthrough, but we're not all the way through. So we don't admit it to somebody. We say, I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine. I'm fine. You doing all right? You're dragging your leg and you're walking like this. No, I'm fine, fine. <laughs> Some of you get down to the last dollar. You won't ask for help. Because you say, I'm believing God. I'm believing God. Well, what are we doing here for? What are we, chocolate milk? Well, we're trying to help you. God already sent us to be a help to one another. He says, bless those around you. Let me bless you. And sometimes we can't get that thought in our mind that we're here as a team. We all help each other. Amen. Amen. And that's part of God's plan. He's the Alpha. He's the Omega. He's the beginning. He's the end. He already knew everything about this man. He didn't have to say it, but he wanted to get him to confess it. Because if he could be honest with himself and say it, he would know he was dealing under a one-touch experience. And he wanted to get completely whole. It couldn't be like it was. He needed to confess, I'm going to need some more. I'm going to have to have a little bit more. I need something else. And he had to make a decision. Am I going to live with what I've got the rest of my life? Not complete, but I am better. Or am I going to go for the whole thing? Amen. And he's only asked you today. Am I going to get better? Or am I going to live like this? Anybody here think you've arrived? You're at the apex. You've got everything you ever wanted. Anybody need another touch? <laughs> Huh, we got some honest folks today. <laughs> See, God's just looking for honest. If you're honest with God, he'll be honest with you. He wants to honestly pour out blessings on you. One good thing to know about this is you can be saved because he said, I still see men walking around like trees and he's dealing with the one experience testimony. But he had to tell the Lord, I still don't have a right perception. It's still not right. Some of us need to admit, I still got some stuff I need to fix. I'm still not right. Some people think they are all that in a bag of chips. They already arrived. My friend Larry Huggins, he said, I haven't arrived, but I have left. Amen. Amen. We have to ask ourselves, what do I need, Lord? I'm going to need another touch from you, a continual touch from you to help me change my perception so that I don't get lost in the things of this world, but I have clear perception of you. Some people are saved, but they're still negative. Some people are saved, but they're still a gossip. Some people are saved, still fighting addictions. And you say, that shouldn't be. No, that shouldn't be. You need another touch. You got healed, but you're not whole. Amen. You need another touch from the Lord. You still are not right in your perception. You're not right in your clear outlook of what the Lord wants to do. Perception. God determines the depth of your inner healing by your perception. Somebody was writing that down. I'll finish that statement. God is, he, God is determining the depth of your inner healing by your perception. The way you perceive it, God looks at you and determines, is he going to need some more? But he won't do more than you ask. And why are you having that much trouble? Because you've been hanging around in an environment that's stopping you from, from receiving all God has. Sometimes it's your past. Like the man in Bethsaida. It was his past. 
a horrible, horrible past. Some of you say, I had a bad childhood. Horrible past. Horrible. It still comes up every once in a while. You need another touch. You need to get out of that environment. I got certain family members I can't hang out with. I thought you're, that's your family. You're my family. I come out from among them, got different. Can't hang out with all my old family because they don't think like me. They chide on me. They make fun of, I mean certain ones, I can't do it because there's evil in there. They won't receive the blessing of God. They won't receive the power of God. They deny it like the entire city of Bethsaida. Wow. Wow. Whatever consumes your perception controls your life. In Colossians 3 in verse 1 it says this. Colossians 3 1. Excuse me 3 2. He says, set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. Where's your mind supposed to be on all the time? On things above. What happens to us? We start thinking about what's around us. Who's around us? What do they need? What do I got to do for them? Oh my goodness, what kind of attitude are they going to have today? Some people have such a bad attitude, you have to prepare four or five days in a row before you can go see them. Because they just got a bad attitude. This man lived in an area that had nothing but bad attitudes. They got a B.A., then got a B.A. Bad attitude and born again. I mean, they, they got graduated with a B.A. They, they, they're bad attitudes. These are bad attitudes. Some people try to live their life with the one-touch experience. And they still lack his nature. They still lack the fullness of his love. They still lack in their finances. They still lack in healing. And they say, how come it's being like this? Because they need a touch from God. They need a continual touch from heaven. You get better when you have the source of heaven always on you. If you're thinking about things above all the time, you're in the kingdom. You're always in the kingdom. And you're always walking like him. Amen. I need a touch. Listen, I had to tell the Lord, I need more touch. I think I, I do pretty good, but I still am not where I should be. I need a touch from God. I want a touch from God. I want to be. I shall be. I will be whole. Yes. Amen. I want you to do it again, Jesus. Do it again, Jesus. Touch me again, Jesus. I want to be whole. In Mark 8 and 25, it goes on and says, And he put his hands on him one more time. Outside the city, he'd already spit on him. He said his men walking around like trees. But he put his hands on him one He didn't spit on him the second time. He didn't have to. He put his hands on him. How come he just put his hands on him? Because he was close. He was so close. He was close. Closer to his wholeness than he'd ever been before. He's close. And some of you in here today are so close. You're so close. You're about to receive from the Lord the totality that you've been asking. You're going to step over the line. You're going to become the fullness and wholeness in him. Fully healed. Fully testified. Fully of the word. I mean the fullness of God is experienced upon you. Because you'll take a full another touch from the Lord. Amen. And he said, when you walk in this, I'll finish the work on you. The finish the work I started. After all, I'm the author and finisher of faith. Amen. So he put his hands on him and made him look up. He didn't look at any man. He didn't look at any trees. He didn't look at anything. He looked up. He said, keep your mind on heaven. Look up. So he looked up and he was completely restored. Amen. He saw clearly. And then he sent him away and he said, don't go back to the city and don't go back to the house. Because they'll rob you. Being around the places you've been before are nothing but death traps trying to steal everything that you got from the Lord. And some people think, well I can go anywhere because I got the mind of Christ. If you got the mind of Christ, run. Get away from them. Don't go back into evil. If you know it's evil, it doesn't mean you have to go there. Amen. So this is what the Lord said. He said you're closer than you've ever been before. Don't go back into the places you've been because I'm trying to do a new work in you. I'm going to take you a place this year you've always wanted to go. Somebody that's going to be more finances than you ever had. 
but you can't do it being stuck in the same place you are thinking the same way you've been thinking wow perception wow the power of perception let's pray father in the name of Jesus we're so thankful grateful for your word to us today father I pray that our hearts and our lives make a change that we listen to your word this morning I want to pray for you if anyone in this room says touch me Lord one more time I'm gonna be honest with you I don't think I've arrived but I need a continual touch from heaven because I intend to get there and if you want that touch from heaven, raise your hand. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, for every hand that's up that says, Lord God, touch me. Touch me. Touch my life. Touch my mind. Touch my perception so that I think about things more clearly than ever before. I follow after the things of God. I will not let the deception of this world steal what I get from you. And I thank you, Lord. I move on in the process of my recovery. And I give you praise for it. Lord God praise for it praise for it thank you Lord I receive the touch of God oh glory thank you Father thank you Father in Jesus name amen now let me pray for a few people this morning you've been dealing with fatigue you've been dealing with blurry vision you've been dealing with you've been dealing with slow healing wounds Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. And tingling in your hands or feet. Or you can't get a grip in your hands or feet. If that's you, any one of those, I'm talking about fatigue or blurred vision or, or slow wounds to heal or tingling in your hands and feet or unable to grip right in your hands and feet. Raise your hand. Here's another touch from heaven. By his stripes you are healed. Oh, glory. <laughs> Father, I thank you for the healing virtue of God penetrating upon us this morning. I pray now for those that have had a cough or pain or nausea. You felt a flu or cold. Raise your hand because you are about to receive the fullness of God on your body right now. Total healing flow in your body. By Jesus stripes you're healed. Jesus stripes you're healed. And now a blanket general prayer for anyone else. You need healing? Grab this from God. Here's a touch from heaven. Finances healed. Bodies healed. Relationships healed. Total restore and restoration in all things this year. In Jesus name. In Jesus' name, amen.